I'm Ken Armstrong. I'm president and CEO of North Arrow Minerals, and welcome to this short presentation on our Distaphony Lithium project. I'm just going to take you through some uh, updated information on the property as we prepare for our field program there this summer. Um, talking about exploration, so I'll certainly be making some forward-looking statements, so please keep that in mind. Um, for those of you familiar with North Arrow, um, we've been a, a diamond exploration company uh, over the last 10 years or so, and we now have exposure to the lithium properties, and in particular, the Distaphne project. Um, but we are dedicated explorationists, and, and we have explored, particularly in northern Canada, for a number of decades, and, and we do know exploration very well. Um, so despite the fact that we have been focused on diamonds and we continue to hold those properties. Our near-term focus is going to be on the lithium properties that we've acquired. Um, lithium is not new for North Arrow. We actually had a focused program of lithium exploration in 2009-2010 um, in the Northwest Territories in Nunavut and also down in the Carolinas. So we are familiar with spodumene peg pegmatite deposits, and we're taking that experience and applying it to our, our properties this year. And in particular, um, Distaphony, which we think is an opportunity to rapidly evaluate a known spodumene pegmatite. Um, we've also acquired a couple of other properties like our Bathurst project. I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly, um, where we're basically looking to try and find new spodumene pegmatite fields, so sort of big picture type stuff. Um, we do retain, as I mentioned, our diamond exploration properties. Um, and the main reason to hold on to those is that the diamond business itself is probably the healthiest it's been in in over a decade. Um, and we also have very strong investor and shareholder support uh, of the work that we've been doing. Our project pipeline, because of the, the, the focus we've had on diamonds, we do have a, a large number of diamond properties. Um, we just note that we've made a number of successful discoveries on those properties over the years. We also have our Oro Hope Gold project uh, in Nunavut, um, something to keep an eye on, and we hope to have some news there um, shortly. Um, and then our Lithium projects, and that's what I'm going to focus on here, in particular, Distaphony, uh, and I'll also have just a couple of, of words about what we're trying to do at the Bathurst project. But Distaphony is uh, our main project of interest going into this field season. It's located um, just 115 kilometers east of Yellowknife. It's right on the shore of Great Slave Lake. It's just about 18 kilometers to the northeast of the Natchalacho Rare Earth Mine. So being on Great Slave Lake, um, despite the fact we aren't on a road, we actually have good access to uh, barge services uh, as well as air support from Yellowknife. But barge service could give us access to Hay River and the railhead that's, that's there. So it is in a good location. Um, we have 100% interest in the project. Uh, and it was acquired as part of a, a strategic alliance that we have with Panarch Resources to look for spodumene pegmatite exploration opportunities in the Northwest Territories and Nunavut in particular. Now, the Staffney itself, it's part of the Yellowknife Pegmatite province. Um, there's other players in this field, uh, including Lift Powers, uh, Yellowknife Lithium Project. Uh, a couple of other companies active include Patriot Battery Metals and Gamma Explorations, um, all of which are covering known spodumene pegmatite occurrences. And, and uh, the Staffney itself, there are two known spodumene pegmatites that I'll, that I'll talk about um, and, uh, and take you through what we plan to do on the property this year. So the two known pegmatites are called Moose 1 and Moose 2. Um, they're both within a few hundred meters of the shore of Great Slave Lake. Moose 2 was test mined and evaluated in particular the 1940s and 50s for tantalum and niobium and, and tin. But they neither of these pegmatites have been fully evaluated for their lithium content, despite lithium mineralization being known in, in the bodies. And we also think, and I'll touch on this too, that we, there's excellent opportunity for additional um, pegmatite discoveries on, on the property itself. So I mentioned Moose 2. Um, it is a classic uh, zoned LCT type um, pegmatite. Its primary mineralogy is feldspar and quartz with spodumene and, and muscovite. It's all, about 450 meters uh, in strike length that's been mapped and it reaches in excess of 30 meters wide. At its widest, it's probably in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 meters wide. Um, spodumene is the mineral that we're, we're uh, focused on exploring for. Um, there are zones of amblegonite mineralization. I'm just quickly touching on that because amblegonite can have much higher grades. Um, you can see that here with the one sample that we put up at over 8% Li2O. Um, but it also is a uh, lithium phosphate mineral 
and it isn't the focus of our evaluation. We're going to work to understand what it might bring in terms of value upside. But we've been very careful in the lithium grades that we are disclosing publicly that they relate to spodumene mineralization. And you can see some of those assays in the little uh, the call out below, in particular, a 1.9% Li2O over a four meter channel sample that was taken in 2010. Um, as mentioned, the property has been uh, historically mined uh, in, a, in a test manner anyway in the 40s and 50s. You can see some of the abutments in the photo here on the, on the left-hand side um, with Great Slave Lake in the, in the background, and those abutments were related to a mill that was put in place. And then there's also a sampling pit, and this is a fantastic photo. It's probably the most important photo of, of this presentation, um, I think, it, that shows um, – the, uh, the, the western wall of the sample pit, which is flooded. You can see water in the background. You can see the pegmatite with the contact uh, with the country rock sedimentary uh, sediments of the Yellowknife supergroup uh, towards the top. That contact dips away from us, so to the west, uh, between 50 and 80 degrees. And probably the, the, that face we estimate is about 8 meters high, and the lower third of it is uh, spodumene-rich zone of the pegmatite where it's probably 40 percent spodumene with some really large spodumene crystals and this is a, a, a close-up photo um, we'd estimate the field of view here is about four meters and you can just see the amount of spodumene that is present in this face and this is important when it comes to evaluating the deposit this summer it provides ready access to the richest part of the pegmatite we'll be able to collect some large samples here that will be uh, useful to help us do some uh, mineral characterization and li liberation studies of the spodumene rich portions of the moose 2 pegmatite. Um, and also just to get across again, very coarse spodumene. It'll be an issue we're going to need to sort out when, when it comes to evaluating um, the, the, the deposit. Uh, but we have ready access to, to this coarse spodumene and uh, it's not something that we're looking for. We know it's there and, and we can, access it quite easily. So th something to keep in mind when looking at how we're going to going to evaluate this property. The Moose 1 pegmatite is to the west of Moose 2. It's about a kilometer away. Um, it has not seen as much historic work, uh, largely because tantalite columbite is mineralization or tantalum and niobium mineralization is not as readily apparent. Um, so it did not see the level of evaluation um, in the last century that Moose, uh, Moose 2 saw. But it uh, is about a similar strike length, uh, has a good width, maximum width mapped is about, um, is about 11 meters. It's also an LCT type pegmatite. Um, and there has been a little bit of, of sampling done for its um, lithium mineralization. Spodumene is readily, uh, has been readily mapped at surface. There's also a bit of embligonite in places. So we expect to see that similar kind of zonation that we see at Moose 2. Um, but there have, as I mentioned, been some channel samples, including a seven and a half meter channel that averaged one and a half percent Li2O. So that's a pretty good grade over that width. The, uh, you can see in the photo below where the channel sampling was happening, that's kind of the terrain around the Moose 1 pegmatite. So it is amenable to channel sampling. So we will look to do channel sampling along its entire length uh, in the early part of the summer um, as we map it as well. And then, uh, and then drilling will, will follow a little bit later. The other aspect of our program that we're looking to do is obviously to make new discoveries and to help us um, with that targeting, uh, the targeting of our prospecting that we're going to do is we have the advantage of, of a large lithogeochemical data set that was collected in uh, 1998 over the entire property. Um, these are composite samples that were collected over, over areas of outcrop. And the intent of those samples was to look for alteration halos that could be related to a large buried intrusion. We've reviewed that data and we see areas where there's similar uh, an anomalous values of lithium or lithium plus cesium um, that we see in the alteration halo around the Moose uh, 1 and Moose 2 pegmatites. There's some areas where we see similar levels of lithium and lithium plus cesium uh, mineralization in the, in the sedimentary rocks. Um, and those areas then are going to be the focus for our prospecting um, this, uh, this summer. Um, four of those areas also correspond with, um, I guess we call them, we're calling them areas of interest that we see on new satellite imagery that we've acquired. I think it's important to note that Moose 1 and Moose 2, they don't jump out at you in the satellite data. There's, they're there. You can see them. It's subtle, though. And we see similar subtle features that are associated with at least half of these 
um, geochemical target areas. And then also importantly, two of them co- correspond with areas where pegmatite was noted in that lithogeochemical geochemical data set. So it's, this is data, these are data that help us get a little bit of a head start to focus our, our prospecting efforts um, this summer. Another showing of note is uh, there is a nickel sulfide showing that's called the moose nickel showing um, that was um, it was sampled around the same time as that lithogeochem data set was acquired. Um, as very high grade nickel sulfide assays came from it. Um, there's a total of six uh, assays from it and they range from 0.9 to over 6% nickel. Um, nickel mineralization is associated with, with pentlandite. There's elevated copper, cobalt, also some PGEs. Um, the nature of the showing is not well understood and it's something that we can also take a look at while we're do- doing our evaluation of the, of the lithium deposits on the property. So going into this field season, we think that, this, that, that the Stephanie is an opportunity to try and uh, determine is it, can a resource be developed here that can produce a spodumene concentrate that's saleable. That's, that's the goal. Um, we think that uh, we'll be also be able to make new discoveries as, as I touched on with the, with the prospecting sam- uh, targets that we've identified. But a real key thing is going to be um, collecting some samples that uh, from the readily available exposures of, of, of the coarse grain spodumene, there's another example on, on this slide that we can see, that will allow us to collect samples that are big enough to help with, with mineral liberation and, and characterization studies. And that kind of gets us a bit, a, a bit ahead of the curve. We'll also be doing the channel sampling. And then later in the year, um, we have applied for permits to allow for drilling, which will be our first view at what the volume potential is for these pegmatites at depth. And that's something that we would look to follow on in the latter part of the summer and the fall. Um, so we'll be very busy. We'll be able to get on the property as soon as the snow melts to do the prospecting work the channel sampling work, and as well as sort of the, the bulk samples that we might want to collect from the, uh, the spodumene uh, mineralization exposures. Um, just a quick mention about the Bathurst project, which is uh, the second property that we acquired through our, um, our strategic alliance with Panarch. This is an area where there are known pegmatite intrusions that have been mapped by government workers along the eastern shore of Bathurst Inlet. They're in uh, close proximity to Sabina Gold and Silver's port facility. So there is infrastructure there to support this exploration. We're focused on pegmatites that are right close to tidewater. And the idea is going to be to get there um, this summer, again, after the snow melts, stand on on some of these features and and see, are these the right kind of of pegmatites? Um, Are they evolved? And most importantly, is there spodumene mineralization? And if there is, um, the idea here is to, to basically identify an entire pegmatite field that is uh, spodumene mineralization. Um, so that is something that's going to happen this, uh, this summer as, as well. Um, we did announce also uh, just yesterday, so on the 29th of March, that um, we've acquired some claims up on Baffin Island. And uh, there'll be more news to come on those, but it's another area where there's known known pegmatite field and we're just pulling together a property that we'll also be able to go stand on this summer and try and see if they're, if they're the right kind of pegmatites or not. And the idea, again, similar, simply to try and come up with a whole new pegmatite province that can be, that can be fully evaluated in an area that's near tidewater. Um, so just to quickly comment on, on markets and, and, and lithium. You know, obviously, North Arrow, we're new to lithium. Um, I think that that message is something that we need to and we'll continue to work on on trying to get across to people because there is value upside in the valuations that the market is providing to companies that are that are looking for lithium deposits um, this is an example of a spectrum of companies some are ready-made um, uh, lithium and spodumene pegmatite vehicles um, we think that there's just just with the, the the properties that we're pulling together i think in particular the opportunity for the rapid evaluation of distaphony that there is value upside we could see very readily um, from our current sort of 10, sub 10 million market cap um, to see upward movement in our share price. And we'll, we'll certainly work on that. Um, the reason there's some of the valuations we're seeing for these lithium exploration companies is pretty straightforward. When, when, when looking forward on the lithium market um, and lithium that's going to be needed to, uh, to aid in the electrification of our, of our economies, um, if every single planned lithium mine that's on the books right now was to get into production with no delays um, by 2030, we're still going to have a supply deficit of over 10% for the lithium that the world is going to need at that time. Um, and so that that supply gap is is real. And, and that's why there's this surge in interest in trying to find these deposits. And, and we think with North Arrow, 
we have with our background in looking for lithium deposits that we have something to bring to to the space and and that's what we're doing um, the other thing that we're bringing along is is this is just a slide of our now yet diamond project if you're interested in that it's a it's a fantastic diamond deposit that has real value um, and it's one that we have been working on over the last uh, number of years in partnership with our with our, our partner Burgundy Diamond Mines over the last couple of years in particular. Um, and through that work, um, just wanted to point out that we have been uh, recognized um, at the Nunamut Mining Symposium with the corporate award twice now in the last five years. And it's not something that we've um, we, we've really highlighted before, but I do want to get across because it shows uh, our ability to uh, work well in the communities um, where we're conducting our exploration, um, communicating well um, through our hiring and and bringing business opportunities. Um, it's nice to be recognized for, for the effort. I think it speaks to our team uh, and how we go about things. And it's that sort of approach that we're also going to be bringing to our evaluation of our lithium projects and in particular the Distaphony um, property this year. So you know, this is our, our summary of, of North Arrow's market right now. Um, we are a highly experienced team uh, when it comes to exploration for a, a whole suite of commodities, but lithium and diamonds. Um, near term, our news flow is going to be focused on lithium as we get going in the NWT, um, but we do see real value upside in our diamond properties as, as well. We talked about the supply gap we're seeing coming in the lithium space. Well, that supply gap is already here when it comes to diamonds. So it's something to keep in mind. That market is going to turn um, and we'll be well positioned for it as well um, to take advantage of, of this uh, gap that we're seeing in the coming uh, years in lithium. And then what we think is already here with our with our diamond properties. Um, strong support from our shareholders, as I mentioned. Um, so feel free to reach out to myself or to Nick Thomas if you have other questions on, on our activities and what we're doing. Um, but thanks very much for listening to this, this quick presentation.